I specialize in brain mapping. I take care of patients who have surgical indications for surgery where we have to map out the brain to make the surgery safe and effective and to take care of patients. Uh, every day in my occupation, uh, we try to understand how to optimize surgery so the patients have the best outcomes. And in my particular interest is understanding how language works. When someone comes to our medical center with epilepsy or brain tumor that threatens to affect someone's ability to talk, those are the cases that I have the most interest in. When I go to the operating room every Monday, this is what I see. It's one of the most important, incredible machines that exists that we've been talking about. And for those of you who haven't seen it, in this two days, this is actually what the human neocortical uh, structure looks like, the human cortex. And what strikes me every time I see this, again every Monday, is that this is the machinery that gives rise to all of our thoughts, emotions, and our ability to communicate through language. It is this cortex that allows us to do this. What I want to spend this talk really focusing on is the computations, not necessarily about the questions of where in the brain does language exist, but more precisely about how does it work? What are the nuts and bolts? What is the algorithm, the computation, that gives rise to our ability to speak? One of the ways that we do this is in the very special opportunity, through the privilege of working with our patient volunteers, where electrodes can be implanted onto the brain in order to seek out where uh, the, the different parts of the brain cause seizures. While patients undergo these procedures, we can have them engaged in a variety of different tasks in the hospital or in the operating room. In this particular case, mapping out the movements when they speak. This is an area of motor control that has been very understudied. 99% of motor neuroscience focuses on how our arms and legs work. Very, very little actually focuses on how we control the most complex motor action that we do, which is called speaking. One of our uh, reports last year, published in Neuron, described that when you look at individual millimeter sites in the part of the brain called the motor cortex that corresponds to the vocal tract, we were able to describe how each individual dis area there actually correlates to movements in the vocal tract. And this animation basically shows you a series of points that are on the human vocal tract, including the tongue, the lips, the jaw, and how they move when someone speaks. It's how this one particular part of the brain that you can see in a red dot on that schematic of the brain, how that part of the brain is relate, its neural activity relates to movement. And you can see that here. Whenever we make this sound like the duh and a dad, the front of the tongue goes up and back, the back of the tongue goes down, the jaw goes up and down, okay? And We've now done this for not just one or a couple of dozen, but now thousands of electrodes over dozens of patients, where we have been able to describe, basically, the patterns of neural encoding, the basic electrical code that the brain uses for every speech sound in the English language. This is in the context, again, of people who are undergoing surgeries as volunteers, where we have the very special privilege to track how their vocal tracts are moving, what they are saying with the millisecond and millimeter precision that we can with our recordings from the brain. And we have now been able to describe this for all of the different consonants and vowels in the English language. Now, if it's possible to actually understand the neural code that allows us to speak, and when I mean the ability to speak, I mean that allows us to actually control the vocal tract in order to give these words and sentences that I'm saying, well, Something that would be of great interest is can we translate that knowledge to create technology, a device, for example, that would allow us to translate that brain activity to words, sentences, text for people who are paralyzed. In particular, for people who have conditions like Lou Gehrig's disease, otherwise known as ALS, or certain brainstem strokes where the cognition in the cerebrum is fully intact, that neural activity is still there, but cannot get out. This is one of my favorite quotes that motivates a lot of the work that we do every day. Although I cannot move and I have to speak through a computer, in my mind I am free. This is from Stephen Hawking, which describes what it is like to be in a locked-in condition where you can have full thought, cognition, and emotion, but unable to actually communicate that. 
So our lab is really focused on how to bridge the gap between a lot of the assistive devices that currently exist, which are very laborsome, uh, inefficient, and uh, not that effective, which basically gets you at about six to seven words per minute. Um, typing can get you uh, at, a, at a words per minute. If you can type and you have normal function, a professional typewriter can get about 70 words per minute. But the way that I am speaking right now and the way that a normal speaker happens, uh, speech happens in a conversation occurs at about 150 words per minute. Okay, this is why speech is such an important behavior to our species because it allows us to transmit information at a very fast rate. I want to repeat that. This is why speech is such an important and unique defining behavior for our species because it allows us to convey information at a very fast rate. So in thinking about how we would translate this for folks who are paralyzed, we really think that it's important to tap into the brain's natural ability to communicate through speech. And so we undergan uh, a project that I worked on with graduate students in computer science, engineering, speech, and linguistics, where we wanted to show if it's possible, just as a proof of principle, if you could record the activity directly from these parts of the brain, can you synthesize what the person actually said? Okay. The very simple experiment is while someone is speaking, we're recording the brain activity from these different areas and we're decoding just the electrical activity from these areas. And we wanted to ask the simple question, can we reconstruct or synthesize the words that someone actually said just by looking at the neural activity? And the short answer is yes, we were able to do that. And yes, uh, there's much more progress to be made with this, but the first step is there, and this involved a bit of artificial intelligence, but also required a good deal of really good design principles to apply to this principle. Uh, these are some of the examples that we had from this experiment where we had subjects basically, um, uh, the original speech is shown, uh, the spectrogram is on the top, and then what we were able to decode just from brain activity, a spectrogram is a frequency and, and uh, time uh, window of what that speech looks like, and you can see overall by vision, it looks visually qualitatively pretty good. Uh, but more importantly is, how does it sound? So in this demonstration, you're gonna first see some of the sensors that are on these parts of the brain that we decode speech from. Then you're gonna see that neural activity control uh, simulation in a computer of the vocal tract. Because what we are trying to do is create an artificial and virtual vocal tract, which there, after that, gives rise to the words, okay? So the neural decoding is essentially controlling a computer simulation of a vocal tract, and that vocal tract is gonna give rise to the actual words. And you're gonna first hear what is synthesized, synthesized from the brain, and then you will hear to compare what the person originally said, just as a reference point. The proof that you are seeking is sign available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeking is sign available in books. She feeling that they must mass any process. Shipbuilding is a most fascinating process. She feel we did the most massive unique process. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Okay. So we thank you. So we published this earlier this year, but in, in reality, it takes a, a couple years to really figure out how to do this. But the first time that we saw this, we were so excited. We said, "Well, let's take this out. We have the proof of principle. Let's see what this looks like in someone who's actually paralyzed." So we created a trial. Uh, I worked very closely with some of my colleagues in neurology, and we, we created a clinical trial called the Bravo Clinical Trial. And uh, one of the first participants in this trial who underwent a surgery where we can actually get these recordings through some um, technology, 
uh, that we've been able to implant directly on the brain surface, not in the brain, but on the brain surface. Um, this is the first time I've really described this, but this is data that was actually acquired just one month ago, where we've asked this individual who was paralyzed, he has very minimal movements of his neck, uh, can't move his arms, can't talk for sure, uh, but he can think this because of a stroke that he had in uh, the brainstem, which is at the top of the spinal cord. In this particular example, we're not asking him to synthesize words, but actually think about certain words, and we're decoding those words. So what you'll basically see is uh, our participant there. Uh, you can see the port actually coming through the, the top of the back of his head uh, as part of this clinical trial. And what you're going to see at the top part of the computer screen is the words that we've asked him to think about, about how to say. And then the, below, you're going to see the computer algorithm essentially thinking about how to do this and then uh, telling us what, it, what, it, what, it, what we've actually been able to get through the algorithm. So this is hot off the press. I'm really excited to share this. This area is, is thank you.